Greetings from sunny VIR nearby Danville, Virginia, and site of the next round of the Pirelli GT4 America Sprint X Championship race number two coming your way shortly. My name is Ryan Marine. Alongside, we have Calvin Fish, Amanda Busick in the pit lane. It's been a busy, busy weekend, lots of racing so far. And last, yeah, yesterday's race one of the weekend for Pirelli GT4 America. Plenty of excitement, Calvin. We had a lot of battles at the front of each of the classes. Two classes, their finishes were separated by less than two tenths of a second. Yeah, it was a very exciting day yesterday. And expect more today because this grid is a little bit upside down. Qualifying was cut short. So uh, there's a few drivers that are out of position that always bring some fireworks with that. Also do need to update a couple of cars that have been withdrawn from today's race, one of which is the Dexter Racing Aston Martin. They had a good run going yesterday. Electronic gremlins all throughout the week in the buildup to the race and ultimately something mechanical that they could not fix in time for today's race. That car has been withdrawn. Also withdrawn, and this is very unfortunate, is the presumptive pole sitter based on qualifying yesterday, the RS1 uh, not led racing by RS1, Aston Martin, driven by Patrick Gallagher, as well as Matt Dalton. Unfortunately, Matt Dalton was involved in an accident yesterday that required him to be transported to the hospital. The car was heavily, heavily damaged, Calvin. So that car withdrawn as well. And that's a real shame because uh, Patrick Gallagher had put in a great effort in qualifying to secure the pole for the race today. More on those stories in a moment. moment but first, a tour of VIR with our Porsche track preview. Hi, my name is Jan Halen, driving for Wright Motorsports here at Virginia International Raceway, and this is the Porsche Track Preview. As we come onto the front straightaway, ready to start uh, start this lap. Front straight, passing start finish here, sixth gear, hard into the brakes at the three sign, down the second gear, big rotation here, using just a little bit of that uh, inside curving, back to power, and then uh, on to turn three, double left-hander, really tricky corner here on the way in lifting a small tap on the brake and then using all that exit curb here on the outside hard onto the brake second gear into turn four short shift up to third turn five and then just barely lifting here into turn six onto the lower s's and then a good stretch here and ready for the famous s's here at uh, virginia international raceway starting right here at the bottom Super fun section of the track in these uh, GT3Rs, uh, all flat out, all the way to the top of the hill. Quick stab on the brake, fifth gear, very fast uh, section of the track, then into Oak Tree, down the second gear, big rotation, getting ready for a good exit, and then back onto the uh, back straightaway, long straightaway, good opportunity here to, uh, to overtake into turn 14, uh, lots of slip streaming going on. Virginia is a track that uh, that really rubbers in, so as the weekend goes on, as long as you don't get too much rain, lots of rubber going down, which uh, makes the track even better. Hard on the brakes here, right at the 50 sign, deep into the brake zone, down the uh, down turn 15, and then ready for the roller coaster. Almost flat, going over this first uh, curve, down one gear, and then onto the front straightaway. And that was one lap here at Virginia International Raceway. What a fantastic track layout, 17 turns, 3.27 miles, making the most of the natural elevation change around the southern Virginia countryside, Calvin. You can see why these drivers revere this place. That was on board a GT3 car, no less of a challenge in a GT4 car. It makes for great racing. It's the ultimate challenge on a single lap, but also it provides great overtaking opportunities here. And over the years, it seems like the drivers have really kind of evolved in finding some new places. Three and four is really a good opportunity as well, which wasn't a traditional overtaking spot. So expect plenty of action. As I said, some of these drivers a little bit deeper in the pack than we expected based on their pace during the course of the weekend. But qualifying was cut short, and uh, we lost five minutes or so from the end of qualifying. I think a lot of people were really trying to time their runs, including our championship leaders uh, are very deep in the pack the 47 nola sport team coming off their fifth consecutive victory yesterday a lot of work to do today to continue that run that's right taking a look at the grid from the front of the grid that there is the nola sport entry you talked about they kept their win streak alive in pro-am but finally had their overall win streak snapped that's because marillo racing really put together a great performance christian shimshack and kenny marillo outstanding in 
picking up the overall win as well as the silver class win yesterday. Yes, both drivers did an amazing job. Kenny starting the race and then Christian finishing off with great uh, race craft and uh, both championship leaders had big days, you know, continued to stretch that points lead with wins yesterday. Sweeping it is going to be tough today. A lot of really stellar cars in this lineup. A lot of manufacturers involved. It's a real melting pot with these manufacturers in the GT4 competition. Yeah, Jack Baldwin, who oversees Pirelli GT4 America, the series manager for the SRO America sanctioning body, really has done a great job assembling so many teams. Each of the classes incredibly well subscribed, and I mentioned it earlier, to have two of the classes come down to a photo finish in a race, it's not the first time we've had that, as a matter of fact. So it goes to show just how good the competition in this series is. Great shot here of the track and the uniqueness of it. Look at the elevation change, even down this front stretch as you come and crest the hill, down into that break zone. Really funnels down there, particularly at the start with everyone together. You know, expect to go three, maybe four wide, and everyone's trying to coexist there through this tricky section here. Very tight, technical. You ask a lot from the race car here. You want compliance over the curves. You're going to use them a lot around this racetrack. You need good top speed. Those BMWs have been very impressive with that in terms of uh, maintaining leads or stretching it. That's exactly where I wanted to go next, Cal. It's like you read my mind. We saw that shot from the start in the front of the grid. Three BMWs in the top four spots. If you watch the races at Sonoma, we talked there about how, for whatever reason, that Sonoma layout, not the best for the BMW M4 little bit better at Coda, but all the BMW teams, they were licking their lips to get here to VIR. They figured this would be a place that that M4 platform could really show its worth. It is. It's horses for courses, and this has always been a very strong racetrack uh, for the BMW. The Bimmer World team of Bill Orblin and James Walker Jr. Won two, uh, we had a triple header last year. They won two of the three and uh, finished second in the other one. They didn't have a great day yesterday, so they're trying to bounce back from the second row of the grid today. So we'll take a look at the starting grid here in just a moment. Keep an eye out for your favorite driver up and down this field, though. Three different classes, all in GT4 machinery. The only difference between the classes, the driver ratings. So that gives you silver pairings or pro-am pairings or am-am pairings in any event. The competition is, is really, really stout. And we really shouldn't sleep on the am class, Calvin, because... Uh, yesterday we saw a great run to the finish ultimately the smooch racing team came out on top again but even though they've had some success this year week in week out you can't guarantee that they're going to be in a position where victory is, is a certainty that's the level of competition is just too high a lot of depth uh, certainly the toyota super is having a very impressive debut season here three wins now for that team with the uh, jezbray and conway big smiles on their faces yesterday as a superb performance just really timed it nicely were patient ultimately got to the front right when it counted but they were under threat there right at the line i think another hundred yards if the start finish line was further down the racetrack they could have lost that win yeah and uh, taking a look at the front of the field here don't sleep on the first porsche in this uh, frame it is spencer pompelli for trg just a couple of years ago had an absolute dominant run in each of the two races before misfortune struck he is really fast in a Porsche, and he is very fast in a Porsche at VIR. Yeah, you got some great drivers up front. I mean, look at—I mean, very impressive for uh, Pestro de Best to uh, now grab the pole with Gallagher car not starting. But Leo Fuji on the front row, 2019 champion. Kenton Cook has been fast all weekend long in that B Sport Racing Aston Martin, and Bill Orblin alongside him. Then Pompelli, Pavaletto. This is going to be some great stuff here in the first half of this race. So the format for Pirelli GT4 America, it is a 60-minute race, mandatory pit stop in the middle. No tire changes, no refueling, just a driver change. And unlike yesterday, the pros in the Pro-Am lineups start today. They'll be turning it over to the AM component of those lineups at the pit stop. More from the pit lane now with the third member of our broadcast team. Welcome in, Amanda Busick. Well, hey, Ryan and Cal, the class of the cars are going by us here in pit lane as we make that second formation lap. I want to go to the auto technic team. You guys were talking about the strength of the BMWs here. That's exactly uh, what this team was saying. They wanted to put get Coda behind them. Their best finish there was fifth on the first race. But coming into this race, you see that JCD car in the number one spot from his qualifying effort. But don't forget, guys, Sean Quinlan right behind him. He just finished first in the GT4 class in GT America. I bet he's going to be on the hunt here today as we kick off this race.
bet you're exactly right, Amanda. We'll have to keep an eye out for that as we get going. She made mention of the fact that there are two formation laps here this weekend. Typically in Pirelli GT4 America, that's not the case. But as we've discussed all weekend, the series is uh, implementing this in order to make sure that tire temps, tire pressures are up and ready to go at peak optimum uh, operating temperature, or at least as close to that as you can be without tire warmers. And so far, the, the payoff of that has been positive. We've had nice clean starts to these races. We have, and uh, with the nature of this racetrack, it's all school. We tend to use the curbs a lot here to gain lap time. So if you stay off the curbs entirely, you're going to be about two seconds off the pace. There's no option but to run them. And this will just give these tires a chance to get up to their operating range. This is the Oak Tree corner. Turn 11, they go through here. Turn 12 is Oak Tree. This one right here. Then the long run down Madison Avenue. The back straightaway at VIR. It's handing some of the highest speeds you'll see. There are several sections, though, where the speeds in a GT4 car. We saw on our race vision powered by AWS yesterday up over 150 miles an hour, even into the 160-mile-an-hour range for some of these GT4 cars. And that's without a lot of the downforce that you see in a GT3 car. So... Those these GT4 machines much less stable in those climbing S's, for instance, when the speeds are almost as high, but the downforce is much lower. No, it's tricky. I mean, the GT3 cars are absolutely planted through there with a the massive downforce that they generate. These cars slightly shy of that, but with the uh, lack of downforce comes low drag, and that's why they're achieving the speeds that we're seeing. Lights are off on the safety car. The Lamborghini Urus leads this beautiful field of GT4 machinery. Look at the different makes and models, everything from BMWs to Aston Martins to Mercedes. Even a KTM crossbow mixed in there with some extra support from the Ryder Engineering Group that helps to make those cars on behalf of KTM. Ryder Engineering factory driver Matt Celia Haug, part of the driver lineup along with Nikolai Elganian, but trackside responsibilities now assumed by the Ryder Engineering Group. That might be a car to keep an eye on a little bit further on back in the pack, but out of hog pin now. Two by two, the formation down this curving front straightaway, straight in name only. Tom Hansing up in the flag stand waiting to give the cue to accelerate to John Capestra Dubetz, our pole sitter. Green flag flies, and JCD gets a great start. Looks like Leo Rouge will fall in line in second. Look at that, 3-4 wide further back. Kenton Cook, a nice start there, down to the inside, lines up in second. It looks like he's going to go at the inside of Leo Fouge there as they accelerate off that corner, all clean so far. Oh, here's a challenge along the outside in the Aston Martin. Leofouge side by side. That's the fight for second. Watch Orblin. He could get the door opened up for him on Kenton Cook as they head down towards turn four. Now Kenton Cook holds that for second and goes for more. And it looks like that might open up a chance for Spencer Propelli to go on the attack. But as I say that, Aaron Povaleno gets to his flank. Ultimately, they do get it sorted out single file. Not a place on the racetrack, Calvin. You want to be too wide. No, just really smart driving there at the front of the field. That really demonstrates the pro capabilities that we have starting this race today. So much talent at the front of this field, really sprinkled all throughout the field. But you look at the pros in these pro lines, no surprise. The top six positions as uh, they qualified for this race, taken by pros in Pro-Am lineups. Then you get to some of the silver lineups, which you'll find are probably more comparable between the two drivers, less uh, of a delta between the two performance-wise when the pit stop occurs. And then the all-Am lineups a little bit further back, but capable of running towards the front, as John Jesbray proved yesterday, qualified fourth overall. This was as well had an excellent run yesterday. I think he led maybe when he came into pit lane, certainly running second legitimately. See Kenton Cook there just losing out a little bit to JCD down the long straightaway. Then feels the heat from behind from Sean Quinlan. And the Aston Martin will be very strong through this sector here down the roller coaster. John Capestro de Betts doing a wonderful job from the front. He doesn't have the experience of some of these guys behind him. Well, Pitt and Cook, a great start to get to second there for B-Sport Racing. Leo Fouge on the defensive. He's got the BMW Master, Bill Oberlin, chasing him down. Oberlin swings to the outside. Leo Fouge defending to the inside in the orange and blue BMW, able to hold off Oberlin's challenge for now. And Spencer Pompelli waiting in the wings, looking for his chance. Yeah, Pompelli and Oberlin were very close together in yesterday's race as well, a little bit deeper in the field. So Oberlin got on the brakes really late there, but couldn't quite clear Greg Leofuge there as they turned into turn one. 
This car, this corner called left hook, then it leads into 5A, 6, and 6A. The lower S's, or snake, as it is called, then under the bridge and up to the climbing S's. Set you up then for a possible passing opportunity into oh. turn 11 and into turn 12, also known as Oak Tree. Everyone settling in nicely now. There's probably P zeros with those two formation laps. Now on lap two of the race should be in great shape in terms of uh, their optimum range with pressure and temperature wise. Oberlin able to build something of a gap to Spencer Pompelli, who rides there in that Porsche Cayman. TRG running that car. What a great association Spencer and TRG have had over the years. He's co-driving with Derek DeBoer. I know him from the Fast Life TV series that he and his wife Brooke put on. And the uh, graphic on the front of the car, that is featuring a new children's book that the family is putting together about the family's collective racing efforts. They're definitely into it. They live and breathe racing and just developed a wonderful relationship with Kevin Buckler and the whole TRG group and their partners and supporters. So they're in the action here today. They've had a decent start to the year, but disappointment at Coda have dropped them deeper into the points than they thought they should be. Had a nice podium run at their home rat track at Sonoma earlier this season. Now BMW leads from Aston Martin, then a couple of BMWs third and fourth before you get to the Porsche of Pompelli, then a couple of Mercedes. Aaron Povoleto and Christian Shimshak running sixth and seventh overall. Shimshak, your leader in silver, and he's got his second place competitor in the silver class, Matt Celia Haug, running right behind him in the KTM. Very unique looking car. You'll know it when you see it. It's right there, the white car in the middle of the picture. Yeah, and they really feel this should be a great racetrack for that crossbow. Been run by Mullerized. Uh, John Mueller has been uh, doing all the prep on that car and the race support as well. A little bit of a change with rider engineering come back onto U.S. soil. Maybe because of the COVID uh, restrictions starting to release a little bit, making that easier for them to do that. It's great to have that kind of diversity, though, in the field. I think at the early days of GT4, you saw more of these unique, we'll call them boutique-type race cars. Maybe they don't have a streetcar variant, or at least not a, a commonly built one. And over the years, it's evolved into certainly not a championship for manufacturers, but you see greater involvement through the customer racing arms of Mercedes or Audi or Porsche or what have you. And some of these boutique cars have been phased out, but this goes to show that in the right hands, with the right drivers and right teams, they're just as strong as anyone. Well, the team, the manufacturer, and the championship here with SRO have done a wonderful job of really balancing that car to be a bit more the same mix. We love the melting pot of the different manufacturers, but before, it was a rocket ship around the corners and really struggled down the straightaway, so it was a real seesaw battle around a complete lap. There you can see very fast through the turns and pretty much even Stevens with the Mercedes there down the straightaway as well. I thought that was impressive, able to stay in that slipstream of the Mercedes AMG GT4. Christian Shipshack just up ahead in the orange car. That is the leader in the silver class. Second place in silver, Mad Silja Haug from Lillehammer, Norway, running right there behind in this fight for class lead and seventh overall. Right behind them, Guy Cosmo sharing that car with Craig Nassi. Great to see Rentec having two cars very much in the mix. Pavolito's having a strong run again, currently six in class and overall. You saw the Rentec team have good results already today. They raced in the GT America, powered by AWS Championship, which is a single driver sprint format for both GT3 and GT4 cars. And they had a podium and a fourth if memory serves, earlier today in race two of the weekend. So, that Rintec team based out of Florida, Stewart, Florida. They're they requested about it, and they know their way around in Mercedes-AMG GT4. Yeah, and certainly those GT America races give those teams and drivers a little bit more time to work on the setups and so forth, so they should be in great shape here today. Strong qualifying effort from Spencer Pompelli, currently runs in fifth, and his co-driver Derek DeBoer is with Amanda. Well, Derek, as we were looking at Spencer early in this race, we were talking about the struggles you guys had in Coda, but the success you found in Sonoma. At this point in the season, where do you feel your team is? You know, we're definitely a little bit on our heels, you know, between our uh, punctured tire at the start of the race in Sonoma and uh, the penalty we received in, the, in Coda starting from the back. But there we did prove that we're a car that can fight for the lead. We were able to move through the, tra you know, through the traffic. 
So I feel like Spencer's in a good spot today, starting a little closer to the front, and hopefully he doesn't have to be too hard on those Pirellis and hand me a car with some grip left in it, and I can go uh, get the thing on the podium. We were also talking about Fast Life TV and the new book that's come out with you and Brooke. How is racing so ingrained in you? You know, it all just started with that question from Brooke of, you know, what passion have you not chased that I need to know about? And when I said I want to be a race car driver, everybody kind of tuned in, and we all teamed up to make it happen. And that's why I'm so proud about this book project, because that was one of her dreams. And it's just an important message for kids, I think, especially in today's day and age, you know, to dream big, limitless, go for what makes your what makes your heart sing. You know, that's what Brooke always says. It's a great story. Unfortunately, not a good story for yesterday's overall winning team, Marilla Racing. We saw in the back of a shot, just as that interview began, this orange Mercedes, Christian Shimshack, off the pace, leaving Oak Tree and his round to a halt. But he might have caught out Celia Howard a little bit and dropped his spot in the overall run into guy Cosmo, who's now up, in, up into sixth overall and in the Pro-Am class. Bill Oblum was dropping a lot of stone as well. I'm not sure if he actually hit pit lane, but he suddenly was dropping down to the order rapidly from the top five position. So two front runners with issues within seconds of one another. We'll try and get an update on those stories as we can. For now, we stay great, though. Look at Matt Silvia now, who's now got Brandon Davis. Knocking on his back bumper. This is the Bill Oberlin story you were talking about. Calvin Hood is up on the 34. Yeah, suddenly dropped a couple of positions through the second half of the lap that he just completed, then hit pit lane immediately. And this is the team and car that won twice here within that triple header weekend that we had when we returned to racing last year. Have to feel for not just Bill, but his co-driver, James Walker Jr. He's going to go full course yellow, I suspect, for the Strand and Marilla racing car. But James is a very enthusiastic participant. Got started doing some touring car racing, stepped up to GT4 last year, back reunited with Bill Oberlin for a second year, and hard to find someone with uh, a more fun-loving attitude. No, they're a great team, great combination. Great to see some of these uh, very experienced drivers like a Bill Oberlin teaming up. Although James is not a young driver, he's a bit later in life as he started up this uh, career in motorsport, but um, great to see the mentor that Bill has been for him. Great results last year. And, uh, but this has not been the start of the year they anticipated, thought they could get a little bit of a reset, returning to a track they had so much success at last year. But it just is not going their way. It is, however, going very well for this Autotechnic team. John Capestro Dubetz, also known as simply JCD, out in front of this field. Wasn't slated to be the pole sitter. If you missed it at the top of the show, Patrick Gallagher was to start on pole in the not land racing by RS1 Aston Martin. Unfortunately, a big crash yesterday that uh, sent Matt Dalton, his Pirelli GT4 America co-driver, uh, but this was actually in the GT America race. Matt, unfortunately, sent to the hospital, but uh, awake and alert was the update there. Just going for further evaluation. Nevertheless, that car very heavily damaged and unable to take part in today's race. And that moved this 52 car to the pole. And he's led from the beginning. Greg Leofus started alongside Calvin, but it didn't last long because Kenton Cook and then Aston Martin, you see weaving back and forth there. He was very aggressive and got the B-Sport racing team up into second. Yeah, and I think everyone anticipated potentially Kenton Cook being the man that would have sat on the pole here if the qualifying session had gone green the whole way through the time allotted for that. But nonetheless, just take nothing away from the job that Patrick Gallagher did to claim the pole position and JCD put in the Autotechnic team. Great performance by the driver and for the team to step up to GT4 competition and run with the front runners is uh, really a testimony to that whole group. Kenton co-drives with Brian Putt, who first started... Working with Brian back when Brian was doing some club-level prototype racing in the SCCA. Ken served as his coach and got him into touring car racing. And ultimately now those two partners in this B-Sport racing team. Kenton and Kenton's wife really managed the team. And it's been a good pairing. Finished fifth in points last year in GT4 America Sprint X Pro-Am. A lot of second-place finishes, a lot of podiums. And that's carried off into this year to some degree, looking for a big win if they can get it. Uh, why don't we go down to Amanda for an update while we're under the safety car? 
Well, Ryan, we've caught up with the Murillo team, and it is all about the highs and lows of racing as you look at their performance yesterday out of the race here today. Kenny, any idea of what happened at this point? Yeah, we're thinking it's, it's electrical. I think the car just shut off on the back straight when he went to go to power. None of the switches are doing anything, so it's really unlucky. You know, we're still grateful to have the Mercedes. I know their support's really, really strong, so they're going to help us figure this out, and we'll be back uh, probably a lot stronger. Well, you did get your mom a trophy for her 50th birthday, so hopefully there's a little sweetness in that. Yeah, just like you said, highs and lows, right? So we're going to we're gonna battle through the lows and cherish the highs, and, um, yeah, just keep moving forward. That's the only thing we can do. It really has been a year of highs and lows for this team. More highs than lows, but a second, a first at Sonoma, then unable to finish despite start, starting on pole in Coda Race 1, bounced back in one Coda Race 2, won overall yesterday, and now out very early in today's race number two. Back to green flag racing. JCD trying to fend off Kenton Cook. Down the front straightaway looking a little bit defensive. Some battles further back, but a great restart from JCD. Cook not close enough to make a move. Yeah, good start there by Pavlito. Matt Siliahak gets down to the inside of Guy Cosmo there. Some nice little battle going on. Macquarie's in the mix there in the 930 from Carbon with Peregrin Racing. This battle here. They move there for the lead by Kenton down into the break zone for turn four. Now he tucks it under. They're going to be side by side, accelerating off of turn four. And Kenton Cook gets it done. Caught JCD by surprise and was able to jump in front of that Auto Technic BMW, which now is coming under attack from Greg Leofouge. Yeah, JCD's just got to get back into a rhythm. Once you get uh, boxed out there through that section, you kind of stall the car a little bit, don't come off that corner with acceleration, and uh, you're sitting duck for the rest of the pack. Spencer Pompelli and Aaron Povoleto sitting back watching this and licking their chops. They want to be a part of that battle for the podium. This is first, second, third, fourth, fifth, all in the Pro-Am class as well as overall. Then you get to Mad Silja Haug, the leader in silver, with the next closest silver competitor quite a ways down the order. So that KTM with a bit of a cushion. What a great restart that was from Kenton Cook. Talked about the number of near misses they've had. They desperately want that win. They do. They've been knocking on the door for so long right now, but he recognizes it's going to be a stern test here today just to maintain that lead. Ideally, he'd love to build a bit of a buff for that team. Led by Eric Peterson on the pit box, one of the shrewdest engineers in our paddock to work with a strategy, get his teammate back behind the wheel and uh, try and seal the deal here today. The window will open in just under 10 minutes, 34.59 on the clock. When you see that, that's when the window will open. It lasts for 10 minutes. Mandatory pit stop for a driver change. That is it. And with many of these Pro-Am lineups, Calvin, the strategy on a day like today, we expect the pros to stay in as long as possible but battles here as we got to move to the inside it looks like Pompelli under attack from Povoleto and Povoleto's got the spot yeah nice move there not very often you outbreak that this is another battle for the lead JCD trying to retaliate oh. and he gets the inside line down in turn four he could grab the lead here it's going to be tight John Capestro Dubet's trying to repave the favor this is where Kenton Cook took the lead one lap ago Kenton defensive able to hold him off. Leo Fouge has to sit and watch that out his windshield. Yeah, I think he was wise there. Just gave those guys a little bit of breathing room to sort themselves out. Later, made a great move on Pompelli. Pompelli now trying to fend off Guy Cosmo, who's made his way back past Matt Celia Haug. Those two have swapped that spot a couple of times, but the fight for the lead is back on. Kitten Cook's got it, but here comes JCD. Yeah, you'd think he'd have gone into defense mode with some of the competitors behind him, but he's still thinking about getting that car back to the front. I love it. I love the attitude. This is why GT4 racing is so awesome. Different mix of manufacturers up at the front, dicing, close racing, downforce, yes, but they can still follow each other closely. It's not, uh, they don't fall prey to the arrow wash quite as much as, as more high downforce cars might. Here comes JCT taking a peek up the left-hand side of Kenton Cook. Kenton closes the door. Track comes back to the right here now, then back to the left. This is the roller coaster leading down to the final turn called Hogpen. Yeah, and I think that Kenton realized he's a bit vulnerable down the second half of these straightaways, so you can see him getting defensive, but probably need to do the same here again. Has a nice two, three car length lead coming out of Hogpen onto this front stretch, but watch him as he crosses, crosses the start finish stripe. He's probably going to go defensive, stick that car down to the right hand side. 
He does exactly that. JCD, though, not close enough to do anything. Look at that Aston squirming, under braking, deep on the brakes for Kenton Cook. Able to fend off Capestro Dubets for now. And Greg Leofouge right behind in third. Aston Martin really gets the power down well with our leader there coming out of turn two. Uses all of the road and a bit more there exiting turn three. Got to be careful that you don't run out too wide. You lose grip right there. Just trying to get that rhythm, hit his marks, get that acceleration out of this corner and attack these S's. And it's one of the few places on the track that track limits is a conversation. But the way it was explained at the driver's meeting, two wheels on the curbing. It's even if it's the inside wheels and you are good to go. So that's what these drivers are trying to manage through that part of the track specifically. Those shots up through the S's. Right there, you slow it back down again through ten, turn 10. This is turn 11, right before Oak Tree. Tricky corner, very easy to get out wide and not feel the grip on that left front corner as you need it. Changing the back of the top 10 to update you on on that last lap. Brandon Davis made his way past Tyler McQuarrie. So put the WR Racing Aston ahead of the Carbon Racing with Paragon Racing Audi in the fight for 8th and 9th overall, 7th and 8th in pro -Am. This, though, the silver leader, Mad Silja Hound in Norwegian. He's got Brandon Davis right behind him. This battle is not going anywhere. Popolato just dropping his left side there into the break zone, trying to deter Spencer Pumpelli. He's been here many times before. That's not going to worry him as he refocuses in. And that probably didn't sit so well with Spencer to see that Mercedes get by and now doing everything he can, keep that momentum up out of hog pen to be close enough to perhaps make a move down into turn one. Very impressive team making their debuts here. Rent Tech, two cars now. Seem to be at the sharp end regularly. Up front, though, JCD is not letting Kenton Cook go anywhere. Look how tight he is as they go through turn one. Uh, uses that bumper just a little bit. Make sure Kenton knows he's there. I don't think Kenton's missing that BMW looming in his rearview mirror. Took a peek to the inside there, perhaps just to fill those mirrors. This time a little bit more under control for Kenton Cook. Didn't slide off and drop that wheel on exit like we've seen the last couple of times. Yeah, I think for JCD, he's thinking about making a move on the entry of turn three. I think he needs to give that up. That typically will not work. Set that turn three up a little bit, and if Kenton should wash wide, maybe it be in a position to have another go at him into turn four. Climbing S's. Top speed at this track at the top of these S's. Turn 10, south bend. Then a quick jump to the left and down towards Oak Tree. One of the slowest parts of the track coming from the highest speed portion. When you're rolling all that speed, then you need to be very disciplined here. Just a couple of miles an hour send you into the gray and potentially into that tire barrier on the exit. Race Vision powered by AWS on the right-hand side of the screen. That is corner speeds at Oak Tree. Toby Grohovic, the here fastest so far. But here comes JCD, close enough on the exit of Oak Tree. And he's able to slip past Kenton Cook and back into the lead. Wow, what a race he is putting together here. He's a little bit closer coming at Oak Tree. Use that straight-line speed advantage that the BMW has. Use the slingshot of the draft. Made that look easy. John will be turning that car over to Tom Capizzi. That's where this race gets interesting because all of a sudden the the way that the table is set with these pros in the cars, then they turn it over to the co-drivers and they've got to bring it home. That's always the real challenge, at least in the Pro-Am lineups, not so in the Silver lineups where Nikolai Elganian fighting for his life right now with Brandon Davis taking a peek up the inside. His co-driver is with Amanda. Oh, and you can see him put his fire suit on. They are getting ready here for this driver swap. And, Nikolai, you look at the performance that Matt's having. You said you had some struggles heading into the weekend. Do you think those are behind you at this point? Yeah, the car's been set up really well. Uh, I'm really happy with how we have a new team here from Rider Engineering themselves. And they put together a really great car. Uh, VIR is not our strong suit, that's for sure. So um, for what Matt's is doing right now, it's amazing. And I hope I can uh, at least do a little bit of what he's doing. What do you find more difficult, being the first driver out or the second? I'm very used to being the first driver because I haven't done much for next before this. Um, so it is a little bit trickier, I feel like, for me to be the second driver because you don't really have that angst going on. Thank you, appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Daniel Ricciardo gets around, doesn't he? He's a busy boy. <laughs> hey, you think... Uh, Grand Prix this morning. He's a spitting image, isn't he? It's amazing. 
but a very talented driver behind the wheel, burst onto the scene a couple of years ago, won a race back when he was an uh, all-single driver. He was a, as an AM, and he won overall. And when you do that, your AM status doesn't last very long, and he's proven that he's a capable race winner in any number of different driver lineup configurations. Yeah, I think you burst on the scene at Lime Rock, as I recall, yeah. just surprised everyone. Didn't know much about the car, didn't know anything about him as a driver, and uh, just been a great addition to our panic, he and his dad and the whole team. Well, he and Mads get along famously. They've been kind of running around the country together. This is the first chance for Celia Howe to come race stateside. I got a text yeah, from Amanda. She apparently ran that by the, the lookalike contest thing with Daniel Ricardo. And Nikolai claims that it's Ricardo that looks like Nikolai. So our apologies there. Well pointed out. 36 minutes on the clock, so we are very close to entering our mandatory pit stop window. Although we probably won't see a ton of activity until we get late into that window here, Calvin. Yeah, I think you'll see some of the AMs come in, certainly. But in terms of these pro-AM lineups, you want to keep your uh, higher-graded driver, typically the faster driver in the car, as long as possible. Here we're looking at Jason Hart aboard that Nola Sport number 47. Won five on the bounce so far this year, going for six straight, but got, still got a lot of work to do. Yeah, didn't get the best qualifying results in what was a truncated qualifying session, but Jason Hart has that car up to 11th overall, 10th in Pro-Am, and we know when he turns that over to Matt Travis that that car doesn't slow down a whole lot, if any. Now, they're a really strong combination, so he just needs to keep it close, close to the front. Position-wise, he's not the best. He's 10th right now in class 11th overall, but you know, in terms of the gap to the front of the pack, he's still within seven seconds of the leader, so that still allows that team to really execute a good, clean pit stop. Could leap up half of that order just on the pit stop alone, and then let Matt Travis do his, uh, do his work as he typically does. Behind that car runs the Bimmer World car, Nick Galante. That Bimmer World team had three cars all in the same accident at Circuit of the Americas, but able to bounce back here this weekend as Celia Haug still under pressure from Brandon Davis. And for the moment, at least, he won't relent. He's been very strong in his defense in that KTM crossbow. But just incredible to see the difference in the dynamic of a lap between that crossbow and the other competitors. Before, it was like a Jekyll and Hyde. You know what I mean? You had one car, that little crossbow, super light, really dynamic around the corners, then would just be breathless down the straightaways. And look what a great job they've done with that car and the engineering and the balance of performance and all of the technical stuff at SRO to get that car in the mix. You hear us talk about the BOP, the balance of performance. That's how you can get a car like the crossbow to be on relatively equal footing to to a Mercedes or a Porsche or a BMW or Audi, pick your GT4 manufacturer of choice. It really is a, an art as the pit window has opened and classic BMW the first to blink. This is not a huge surprise. This is a great silver pairing. Toby Grohovic giving way to Stephen McAleer, who's already run today in Lamborghini Super Trofeo competition. Yeah, and what a run he put together yesterday. The first lap that he put together was a monster from eighth. I think he went all the way up to second, led the race, turned it over, and then unfortunately had a sway bar come disconnected for Toby to try and bring it home. So he struggled there and lost a few positions at the end. But another strong day for classic BMW. And that was a car that looked like it might win overall yesterday, but because of the nuances of the qualifying and the way it broke down, they're coming from a little bit further back as John Allen gives way to Chris Wilson, another car they ran up towards the front as an AM-AM pairing yesterday, especially with Chris at the wheel. John dropped back a little bit during his stint, but as soon as Chris gets in that Mercedes, watch it fly. Yeah, and that's a backup car. They had an incident earlier this weekend, and initially when they put that car on the racetrack, did not have the pace, but boy, did they go to work. Chris Wilson was magic here in the early stages yesterday. Back to the overall lead. John Capestra Dubetz has built a bit of a gap. It was less than a second at the line. It looks like it has extended somewhat. The Auto Technic BMW out ahead of Kenton Cook in the B Sport Racing Aston Martin, and they will wait at least another lap before they make their mandatory call to the pit road inside of this pit stop window. 76 seconds is the delta here at VIR. 
That's how much time you must spend on pit lane at minimum, although there is a joker in play. Yeah, there's a one-second joker that you can use once per weekend. So there were a couple of teams using it yesterday. I don't even know which teams those were exactly. So everyone's got to pay careful attention. And this stage of the year, unless there's some sort of uh, real snafu, we're seeing a lot of these teams really nail those pit stops to be within a second or a second and a half of the minimum delta. Tom Chris Wilson leaving the pits in that capstone racing car. Contenders in the AMP class just in front of the overall leaders and don't expect him to be holding them up much, if at all. That car was really fast yesterday. Back to the pits here. Number 94 car, Chandler Hull gets out. John Miller gets in. These two have been quite a pairing over the last year plus, racing all over the globe. Probably done about 50 of those driver changes in competition already this year. It seems they've been racing everywhere and anywhere. As you mentioned, Chris Wilson aboard that capstone racing engine in the 16. Mercedes AMG immediately up on the wheel and up on pace. Focusing forward, seeing how far he can climb back up the order here before the checkered flag this afternoon. Staying on the lead lap here is crucial, though, right, in case of a full course yellow. It really is. That, that's really the key. You can get caught out by that, particularly if that yellow falls within the pit stop window before everyone has cycled through. So a little bit of a risk. But uh, nonetheless, uh, people have their eye on that strategy. Look at this, Matt Zilia Haug still clinging to this position. That is seventh overall. It is not a battle for class position, which I'm sure comes as a frustration for Brandon Davis. He'd love to clear that crossbow and see if he can run down Guy Cosmo or maybe have something for Spencer Pompelli, try and get up a couple more spots before Paul Terry jumps in. And this will give him a bit of a reprieve as Zilia Haug comes down pit lane, or silver class leader. Such a unique uh, design with that car where the whole kind of screen lifts up for the driver to get in to the cockpit. Brand is going to try and go on the attack here for the last five minutes. He'll probably do a couple more laps before he turns it over. Here comes Celia Haug, Nikolai Elganian, who we heard from a moment ago, will get in. Of the pit stops we've seen so far, second place in silver came in previously. That was Tomas Mejia handing over to Nick Whitmer, the ST Racing team, right there, very close to where they wanted to be, just eight tenths of a second over the minimum. Cole Corallo, Tim Barber, they've made their sp their swap also pretty close. Chandler Hole and John Miller did give up about three seconds, uh, 79 seconds spent on the pit lane for that pairing. Will hurt them in terms of track position to some degree. As tight as the front of this field still is, these pit stops are going to be crucial. If you drop three seconds, if you're a little bit closer to the front, you could cost you two, three spots right now. No clear track for our leader, John Capestra Dubetz, but as we anticipated, Chris Wilson running right there with the leader's pace in a car at least dropping a wheel, if not off in Oak Tree. To see if we can get more information on that, but at the very least, a near miss for someone as Celia Haug comes out of the pits. 77.7, .7, so they left a little bit on the table there. You'd like to be a bit tighter than that, but not a disaster by any stretch for our silver leaders coming into the pits anyway. Yes, and that was actually Elganian leaving the pits, taking over from Celia Haug. We saw this car make a stop early in the pit window. Stephen Mackler, very fast Scottish driver, was extremely impressive yesterday, as mentioned, has been racing this weekend here at Lamborghini Super Trofeo competition. So pulling double duty, as are several drivers across multiple series. That could be a big battle between Macklear and Elgany and full of silver honors here today. Keep tabs on that. I think you could see the crossbow just up the road at the beginning of that shot, and that would potentially be first and second or maybe third, depending on how it shakes out. Second BMW through is the one we're talking about. That's McAleer right there. Bit of an adjustment, jumping out of the Lamborghini Huracan into uh, this BMW, but he's used to that. He's used to running multiple races on a weekend. A little bit sideways there through turn 10, really wringing its neck right now. And again, we'll probably check the tire pressures, maybe uh, that little, little air out from that earlier stint by Toby Grohovic, but you're dealing with the tires that started the race from your teammate. Hopefully he left something for you. So Nick Whitmer, who has taken over for Tomas Mejia, has made a second trip down pit lane. It was a right around 26 seconds. The time it would take to drive through the pit lane without stopping would be, so that leads me to believe that might have been a penalty served. 
Bill Oberlin is in the pits, as is David Sergizen. One of the AM-class cars, the Toyota Supra. They'll be making their driver exchanges now. Spencer Pelly. Right behind him, 38 is the Nick Whitmer car that has made that extra stop. So as a ways down the order, uh, that would mean this would not be for position. Just a couple minutes left in this pit window, so it's going to get really busy really fast. Yeah, and for these guys like Pompelli, you could stretch it one more lap, but here we see it. People are willing to take the risk if anything should go awry on that end lap. You'd hate to cut it too close even though you want to maximize the advantage of your faster driver. Pampali stays out, so Kevin Buckler rolling the dice there with TRG. This is our leader. John Capestra dubetz will hand over to Tom Capizzi, the Auto Technic team. They've been good all weekend long. Now just need a nice, clean driver exchange to try and hold on to that lead. Kenton Cook climbs out of the B-Sport racing car. In goes his co-driver, Brian Putt. Kenton will help get him strapped in was second on the road as they came into the pits. We also saw Greg Leofouge pit from third. I think Kenton Cook will be uh, somewhat satisfied, but maybe a little bit disappointed at the same time that he didn't manage to grab that lead and extend the gap a little bit to give this team an opportunity here to get Brian Putt out with a bit of a comfort zone. It's going to be a real thrash here out of pit lane. The Oberlin to Walker stop on the last lap was about three seconds over. Sergizen to Forbush considerably over. A report from Amanda that the Bill Oberlin, James Walker crew is a little bit worried about temperatures in that car. So that's something to keep an eye on as the cars are released. And it looks like the Auto Technic guys might have dropped a couple of spots because it is Brian Putt that leads them off of pit lane, followed by Sean Quinlan. Wow, 76.001. <laughs> You can't do a lot better than that. Maybe a thousandth of a second. A second, yeah. <laughs> they need was, to tighten things up. That was fantastic. They're off their game, Ryan. <laughs> Leo Fuji and company, they get out in 76.6 seconds. This is what was crucial for Auto Technic. It was 81 seconds. Yeah. And there's a red flag up there for the car barn with Peregrine racing entry, Macquarie. To Seagull, 71.2. That's not going to cut it. No, that is way too far under. So anticipate something coming from the stewards regarding that. But great work by B Sport Racing and Brian Putt now. When this all shakes out, should find himself towards the top of the charts. But still, two stops yet to go from the front runners. Jason Hart just now pitting to hand over to Matt Travis. But Aaron Povoleto and Spencer Pompelli, they were running in the top five. They are in the pits now, and we saw how crucial those pit stops can be when we saw the Tech Auto Technic car drop back a couple of positions just by being a little bit over. Yeah, as we suggested, it was so tight at the front of the pack, and this is what Lola Sport were looking for, our championship leaders in the Pro-Am category. They really hope that keeping Jason Hart out there now nailing this pit stop, knowing that Matt Travis will pick up the reins and be immediately on the pace. What can they do? This crossover is going to be significant. So Brian Putt needs to be on it now. He needs to be pushing any second he can make up here. That will help when we see the TRG car and the Rintec car rejoin the race from the pit lane. Paul Valado done another great job here today. Should be being released here shortly. Here comes Brian Putt. Here comes Brian Putt. He will sweep past and maintain that lead. Derek DeBoer leaves the pits behind in the TRG car. And here come some of the other leaders at speed. This is going to get interesting, Calvin. Yeah, nice job there by the TRG group. 76.6, a six tenths outside. And our championship lead is Hart and Travis, 76.4. Now, without a tire changes, these tires are hot, but the driver isn't. First lap out of the pits for Derek DeBoer, and instantly he comes under attack from Sean Quinlan. I may disagree with that comment. We'll leave that alone. <laughs> Apologies to the DeBoer family, but for now he's able to hold him off. And up front, it is B-Sport racing in the lead. Kenton Cook had a great opening stint, and he's turned it over to Brian Putt. Kenton, though, standing by with Amanda. Well, Ryan, as you talk about the push needed from Brian Putt, as you reflect on your time in the car, how do you feel about uh, your performance? You know, it's, I, I felt, uh, felt pretty good about it. 
Um, we had a really good car. Uh, I think it's going to be good on the long run. So hopefully uh, the BMW starts to fall off the pace a little bit at the end. Brian can bring it home strong. Um, yeah, I mean, we've got handling, but we need some straight line handling to keep up with these BMWs. But, yeah, Peace Port guys are, are really good. Um, and we've been having a good time this year. So I uh, look forward to hopefully doing some more and getting, getting the podium here. Were you able to relay any information over to Brian during the driver swap? Uh, no, there's not much time. <laughs> There might be like 45 seconds stop, but as far as anything that would be useful in that time would probably just screw up the driver change. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Good insight into just how frantic those driver changes can be. Brian Putt out in front. Did want to update a couple of things on those pit stops. Jason Hart to Matt Travis. That was 76.4, so pretty solid. Spencer Pompelli to Derek DeBoer, 76.6. The loser was the Pobolator to Schwest stop because that was 81.9 seconds so that dropped him back and I think that now might just put him in the clutches of Matt Travis here if I'm not mistaken this is exactly how Nola Sport drew up in terms of gaining positions on that round of pit stops that's exactly what they've done oh there's a bump there and Quinlan into the bumper of DeBoer DeBoer goes around and oh that was close Rush West somehow able to avoid the TRG Cayman Jason, or sorry, Matt Travis sneaks through and picks up two spots in one. Oh, that could have been disaster. That's all coming Nola Sports way right now with their strategy, keeping Jason Hart out there, keeping him close to the front of the pack, not too much of a time delta, leapfrogging guys on pit lane, and a little bit of luck there with the racing going on in front of them. And this, I think, might be a battle for silver class honors towards the front of this. Elganian with the lead. McAleer is second. And McAleer, I think, has just made his way around James Clay in the sister car, so now runs right behind Nikolai Elganian. A little bit further back in the overall order, but yep, that was it right there a second ago. Up front, though, good fight going on here. Sean Quinlan, after that contact, now he has Tom Capizzi right behind him. to wait and see. Hate to uh, give too many comments on what is a steward's decision, but... Pretty much uh, black and white there, I feel. I think you're probably right, but three stewards in addition to the race director, they'll be taking a look at that. Here comes Capizzi looking to the inside of Quinlan as they make their way down the back straight. And he's just got to settle in. He's got to be uh, thinking about, okay, let, let's wait and see. Wait and see what the stewards do. And in the meantime, just lay the hammer down. Try and just gap yourself as much as possible here in these few laps that you got to play with. Let's take another look at it. Down in the brake zone, the ball comes across. Quinlan very deep on the brakes. Just gets up and on the curb in the dirt a little bit. Just gives him the slightest of nudges. There wasn't much there, but he was lucky that that Porsche didn't back into his left rear corner as well. Schwest there has to take evasive action, and uh, Travis says, thank you nicely, I'll go on along my way also saying a big thank you is brian putt because his lead has grown to seven seconds as the cars behind him have been fighting quickly. Slowing. yeah big looks time he may have cut down a tire something is amiss no question about that he pulls off track so uh, we did see that that incident was under review but that might just become academic because something has gone wrong for stephen cameron racing and this car great starting stint from greg leofuge looks like it's going to come up empty however problems for sean quinlan yeah couldn't see any steam like a radiator was punctured or anything couldn't see if it was a flat tire he continued to limp around so some other technical issue we suspect oh and a problem here for oh, Miller. yeah chandler hall sharing that car see what happened a little help there yes Siegel got into him there. And now we've got Elganian sliding wow. off the track as That's well. Leader. I wonder, could there be some fluid on the surface, perhaps? But he was right there and leading at the time. Actually, he had just lost the lead on that previous lap. McAleer had gotten by. Okay. Let's see if we can get an answer to this question. Just lost it. I mean, whether there was any uh, fluid on the race track. <laughs> Wide. It's really dusty offline here. I think that's the thing. I thought I saw some dust coming up as the car kicked loose. And perhaps. He was wide. He, he, he missed the apex just a little bit there through 10. 
and more issues. Is that the John Miller car? Lots going on here in the last uh, <laughs> five minutes, that is for sure. And all, this race upside down. While all of this has been happening, Brian Putt continues to hold the overall lead. The PC's a little bit quicker, but not enough really to make a huge impression. Just a couple of tenths on that last lap. Yeah, with only 17 minutes to go, if Brian can keep his head down, he might be in line for the first win as a team. Long awaited. John Jesbray in the Supra at the back of this picture, taking a peek to the inside of the heart of racing, Aston Martin. That is Gray Newell behind the wheel, and Jesbray with that pass moves into the top 10 overall. He is the leader in AM. For their fourth win of the season, he's continuing to get the job done. Great team led by Tony Ave, Thomas Knapp, the engineer there, working with that group. Now, when this pairing was announced, I think most of the attention was on his co-driver, Kevin Conway, ex-NASCAR Cup Series Rookie of the Year, with a lot of experience in stock cars, and in recent years has done some hey. car racing. Frankly, we didn't know a whole lot about John Jesbray, starting with how to pronounce his name. <laughs> also, where does smooge racing come from? That was a great story. They named it that because his nickname as a kid was smooge. He was plump, shall we say. This is coming from John himself, and... So uh, they named the, the, the team after that, and he's been a revelation. Just one year of racing in anything before showing up here this week, this year, and, and they've been excellent, and John especially so. As we go full course yellow with just 16 and a half minutes left, that will shake things up even further. Oh, boy, the B-Sport guys did not want to see this. A nearly seven-second lead goes away, and guess what? That brings Matt Travis all the way up to third and basically right there for potentially another win. Yeah, very much so. So uh, it's a reset, and it's all coming in all the sports way. We talk about the starts that they've had for the last two seasons, leading comfortably in 2019, same in 2020, and just not quite sealing the championship deal. They're going for six straight here right now. They have about a 60, 70-point lead in the championship and sitting in a great position once again today. Update on the Elganian spin. Amanda just sent me a text. She's talked with the team, and Nikolai came on the radio and just acknowledged a small driver error. So simple as that, and look, it's easy to do. It was. As he turned in there, it looked like he just missed it a little bit, and uh, as the races continue, you get a lot of dust, debris, marbles on the outside of the corner, the speed and the commitment you have. If you miss it a little bit, lucky he was on that side of the racetrack, and he had somewhere to go with it. Here's another replay. That is the issues that befell Sean Quinlan. They just shut down on him. Yeah. Well, it is a fairly hot day today, and there, we have seen in previous years instances of cars where the temperatures get up, they uh, they can go into kind of a safety mode to try and protect from damage from that. We might have an update on exactly what happened. Greg Leofuge is standing by with Amanda. I think there's still some confusion from this team as what had might had happened. Gregory, do you have any prediction of what could be wrong with the car? We're not too sure. Uh, we're we're running a little hotter than expected um, yesterday and and today. So the guys triple checked everything yesterday night, and uh, we're not too sure what happened. So. The car just died. Where do you take this performance as you head towards Road America? Uh, you know, it's it's a very competitive field. There's a lot of cars now, so uh, a, a race like this really hurts you in the points. But, um, you know, after that, all you can do is try to win uh, the next one and see what happens. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. That's a good attitude and really the only one you can have. But they did allude to some higher temperatures we'd heard Bill Oberlin's team concerned about higher temperatures. And it just makes me wonder. It's pure speculation. But... These cars do have these safety modes there. Correct. And, and I think that's a carryover from the streetcar in a lot of cases. GT4 much closer to the streetcar variations than their GT3 counterparts. So, again, we've seen it in the past when the temperatures get up. The car says, yeah, this doesn't look good. I want to protect the important internals. And, unfortunately, not great in a racing context sometimes. Yeah, I called it limpo mode, and the BMW engineers didn't like that. But it's uh, more of a safety mode. It'll drop off the power, but doesn't typically shut it down like it seems to have uh, uh, happened to Quinlan's car there. Our, our buddy Colin get on you for that one? He does. Well, we'll call it safety mode, and hopefully we don't hear from Colin about that one. But uh, we kid because we care. 
It's a real shame, though, for that team, um, especially coming off of a great run earlier this morning, Calvin, from Sean Quinlan. He, he's really been in fine form all year long, but won again in GT America, won his class in GT4. He's had a great weekend there, and, and he and Greg were awfully solid in, in race one of the weekend yesterday, too. Yeah, they were. Um, the, the team's solid. I mean, Stephen Cameron's an ex-racer himself, very fast drive, had a lot of success back in uh, former Atlantic and championships like that. So um, it's great to have an ex-driver on the pit box. He's sharp with the strategy. He loves to keep tweaking on the race car, making it better throughout the course of the weekends. He's got great feedback from initially Greg, and certainly Short is now able to uh, uh, quantify the changes that they're making as well. That was the Bill Oberlin, James Walker car being towed back. So when we were having trouble identifying what BMW was stopped off track a few minutes ago. Evidently, that would have been the unfortunate victim. We did hear from Amanda earlier that Bill Oberlin and team were a little bit concerned about temperatures in that car, too. Not sure if we should connect those dots or not, but something went wrong, and that car was parked off track now, having to be towed back to the paddock. Hopefully, though, Calvin, it's a quick cleanup, just a couple of... Uh, laps potentially of green flag racing to go and the one guy i am sure would that would love to see that is matt travis sitting in third just rubbing his hands together thinking this win streak it's not dead yet no no but again you want to keep that streak alive you know he's going to be going for it but don't risk a big bundle of points with the party, so yeah, I mean, you'd love to sweep the board, win every race of the championship season, but I think Matt is savvy enough to know he'll, he'll make the right moves, he'll make the right decisions. I could see this decision going two, one of two ways, right? On one hand, they have this massive lead, so maybe you kind of, in the points that is, right. so maybe you feel like you can take a risk, mm -hmm. you can stomach it if, if something were to go wrong, but on the other hand, you just bring home a third, and that gap just keeps on growing and growing, and it becomes even more insurmountable. So big picture, small picture, it's like the devil on one shoulder, the angel on the other, and, and who knows what Matt's going to choose. Yeah, and then when you're on a roll, it's like, well, nothing can go wrong. Okay, if I risk it and it goes you know, adrift, we've still got a massive points lead leaving here tonight. But those points today, maybe that's you know reflection past couple of years. You have a couple of bad rounds of the championship, it all starts to go south, and you think, boy, I wish I'd just taken that nice podium on a VAR earlier this season. You know what? I think you might be onto something there because we've talked about it before. Second in the championship each of the last two years. Last year, it was by two points. That's it. So that has to be in the back of the mind of, of Matt Travis here and the Snow Sport team. They're on the radio with him, I'm sure, talking him through these exact scenarios. It's a well-run team, John Shurik and company. Looks like he's going to get his chance, though, here because the lights are off on the safety car. Field a bit strung out, but I think we are getting closer to a restart with just under 10 minutes remaining. Safety car pulls off, and here we go. What a jump from Brian Putt. He builds a seven-car length advantage coming out of Hogpen. Tom Capizzi giving chase then. It's Matt Travis, and he's got Stephen McAleer coming. Yeah, McAleer, this is not for class position, but down to the inside of Travis. Travis sweeps around the outside. He's trying to make that move for second, but that opens up the door. McAleer clears him, and it may get two for one here. Well, Travis might be better served just trying to follow McAleer through. A lot of dust up in the background of that shot. Hopefully everyone kept it on track. Watch McAleer here try and set up Capizzi, get to the inside. Good racecraft right there. It's going to be tight, though. Travis keeping an eye on that. Again, this is first and second. Capizzi's off. He's through the weeds. Felt the pressure from the inside on McAleer. Just ran off course there. That has allowed Travis now to be up into second in class, but still third on the road. But now right behind one of the fastest drivers in a GT4 car, Stephen McAleer, trying to run down Brian Putt. And for Putt, that's not a class battle. McAleer is the leader in silver. Putt is the leader overall, but also in Pro-Am. So it'll be curious to see how that fight develops. Should it emerge? Capizzi with all kinds of problems yeah, backing up this he's field. He's got an issue. I mean, he's being freight trained right now. So I wonder if he's got a slow puncture or something. He's definitely lost pace. Amplast lead just changed hands. That was Chris Wilson knifing through on John Jesbray there in Oak Tree. Jezbray in the Supra a little bit further back, side by side with the ST Racing car, the BMW, and then it is Wilson now leading in Am in that B 
Big Al, University of Alabama, Mercedes, who says elephants can't fly. <laughs> we got full course yellow once again, it appears. Yes. Oh. Ooh. Nikolai Elgani and a hard hit. Cockpit is open. Nikolai into the tire barriers. Where is this? Is this in the horseshoe? Yeah, one and two here, I think. Yeah. See another car involved there limping away. Now remember when the leaders were coming through, we had this in the background, this part of the track, and we saw all that dust up, and I did wonder if something might have happened. Now this was the early leader in the silver class. Oh, there's the damage. Yeah. Great nil involved. We assume could be two separate incidents, so that's true. Have to wait and see. And here's Capizzi in the pit lane. Boy, that's heartbreaking because John Capestro Dubats had a great opening stint. Didn't have the best of pit stops. Yeah, looking at something suspension related, I was thinking maybe there's something going on with all of these BMWs. They've had a few issues here today with. Uh, but he's feeling something different to that, handling wise, I would imagine. Let's get an update on Nola Sport with Amanda. Well, Jason Hart is sitting along watching this as well. And Jason, you guys had a, uh, executed the pit stop very well. You always seem to be exactly where you need to be, up significant positions right here in third. What keeps your team pushing? You know, I think it's just a, a strong team effort. Everybody that's on this team is, is really picked because of their drive to succeed. You never, ever hear good enough over here. It's always, what can we do? We come up with three line items. Do we, is there a fourth one we need to put on the list? I mean, it's, it's drive. I mean, we look at hours of data, hours of video. We don't walk around the paddock. We don't have a lot of probably as many friends as other people because we're so buried in trying to get our race performance as sharp as we can. Never good enough. You shook your head when the four co full course yellow came yeah. back out. Were you guys going for the overall? Oh, yeah, we were. Damn right. Um, and I think we, well, let me back up. McAleer got by. BMW, that BMW has got more pace than we've got, but the Pro-Am win, hell yes. Well, there's the positive outlook. They certainly would love a chance to restart this race. Less than six minutes left. I think the big question is if anything on that tire wall needs to be replaced. Could be tough to see more green, unfortunately. Word is that there is no barrier repair required, so that is good news. It just needs to clean up all the dirt and debris, and boy, we could have a shootout here in the final couple of minutes if they can get this taken care of. Now you'll look, this train moving very slow, and I think that's because the safety car is trying to figure out how to handle the ailing Aston Martin of Gray Newell. I think a smart move there by Gray pull that into the ancillary pit lane on the other part of the track. Just get that car out of harm's way. It's going to be the stricken crossbow is going to be the issue. If they can get that out of harm's way, we should see maybe a lap or two. Oh, for Brian Putt, there's Nikolai out of the car. That is great to see. It looks like a pretty heavy impact. But yeah, going to need to get that car cleared. We're going to have a restart. These caution laps... Well over two minutes each. It's going to be tight. Mm -hmm. That it will. Oh, what is Brian Putt thinking other than please don't restart? I mean, he, he is he and Kitten Cook and that team, they put so much work into B-Sport Racing, and they are right where they want to be. They had a huge lead, so it's not like they would inherit this if it should end under yellow. I, I have to believe that celebration would be huge if it did end up going their way. Yeah, I think the best case scenario is a one lap shootout. That would have to happen next time by because uh, you know, you're looking at probably a three, three and a half minute pace lap here behind the safety car. So we'll just leave a few seconds left on the board. Now it's not a great day for Bill Alberlin and James Walker, but perhaps some consolation, the Crown Strike fastest lap of the race does go to Bill. It goes to show how strong the BMWs have been here all weekend long, but it's an Aston at the front then a BMW, then a couple of Porsches, then we get to the Mercedes of Ross West, and how about James Clay on his home track? Didn't have a good day yesterday, but right there in the mix, driving with Nick Galante, who's new to the championship, but has really been enjoying it. James with his new shoes where he can show off his toes. <laughs> you missed it, uh, the story earlier this week that he's known for wearing his sandals around the paddock, and so he's got new racing shoes on which 
it's basically drawn on or printed on or however you put an image on a shoe of uh, a foot in a sandal and some of the toenails have been painted and James got a real kick out of that. Fun group, great team. They worked hard between the last rounds at Coda and uh, getting their cars up and ready for their home track here at VIR. There you see the damage to the right front on the uh, heart of racing Aston Martin. Great Neil Shear in this car with uh, someone who's won a lot of races and championships here, Ian James. Yeah, Ian's been really impressed with Gray in his lower 20s, new to racing though, and stepping into arguably the most competitive GT4 field you'll find anywhere. Any result you get in this field, you've earned it. And uh, if you want to cut your teeth, if you want to see if you can make it, this is a place you can definitely learn some of those things. It's good if we're going to go back green flag running, but it means that there's not going to be enough time to skip around this racetrack one more time. So. A lot of cars weaving back and forth to clean off any debris from the tires, dragging the brake paddle a bit to build temperature in the tires. We expect a white flag this time by with the yellow, so I don't think it will be going back to green. At least that's the initial indication. In a, way, a lot of respects, a shootout would have been fun, but what a fitting win should it go that way for B Sport Racing. The bridesmaids so frequently over the last couple of years, but no longer, assuming they can make it around one more time behind the pace car, Brian Putt and Ken Cook. Those two drivers for a small upstart team that everything got put together kind of at the last minute last year, and COVID threw them a bunch of curveballs. And talking to Ken, he's been, who, who helps to manage the team in addition to driving and coaching, having a full off season to actually prepare they feel like they've really come into this year with a lot of wind in their sails they have got big time expert expectations and they've been living up to them they've been fast every single weekend so far yeah it's a wonderful performance it's great to see the team evolve and as we said earlier in the race been knocking on the door so many times so it'll be a big win for them but for brian he's used to winning he won the tcr cup back in 2019 so victory lane seven times that year a lot of those uh, key personnel are still working with him so uh, it's a good group and that's what it's all about putting the building blocks together there's eric peterson the engineer there's kenton obviously his co-driver they've been around a long time it seems like it's a formality now <laughs> strange things happen in races we'll still be sweating until they see that car well, get back to the finish line second overall stephen mcaleer and Toby Grahovic, but leaders in the silver class. Came out of nowhere, quite frankly. There were some troubles for two of the front-running cars in silver. The ST Racing car, Tomas Mejia and Nick Whitmer, I think had a drive-through penalty. Certainly, they made a second trip down pit lane while running in the top two. And then we saw the crash from Celia Haug. He had lost the lead to McAleer already. At that, uh, had, had an off-track excursion as well prior to the crash. But these two jumped onto the scene in the silver class at Coda. Caught a lot of people's attention. And it's going to pay off with a victory, it would appear, here. And then finally, the AM class. It was in traffic. It was all mixed up, but we happened to catch it. Chris Wilson diving to the inside of John Jesbray there in Oak Tree. That ultimately was the move of the race in AM. Yeah, because you can never be guaranteed, we said before today, that all of the minutes are going to be there for you to work with. So uh, that's the experience counting. You think, well, just be patient. I've got another five laps to go. There wasn't another five laps to go, and that's the experience of Chris Wilson, his, um, his age. It was a decisive move. I think his experience working through traffic would pay, pay dividends for him. Maybe that's something that a youngster, John Jesbray, still... Trying to hone his craft a little bit. He's going to take away a lesson or two from the way this race unfolded. Yeah, still an impressive weekend no for them with a win. A second-place finish extending their AM-class lead. All right, out of the final corner, expecting the checkered flag in the hands of Tom Hansing. It comes under yellow, but the bridesmaids no more. B-Sport Racing, Kenton Cook and Brian Putt, they win overall in race two at VIR. Stephen McAleer and Toby Grohovic get the win in the silver class.
And we wait now for Chris Wilson to cross the line. Capstone Racing, the win in the AM class and 10th overall. Pirelli GT4 America, some of the best racing you will find on a road course anywhere in the country. Again, does not disappoint. Let's take a look at the final results. Brian Putt, Kenton Cook get the overall win and the Pro-Am win to boot. Big for their championship aspirations. They came into the weekend fourth in points, 60 points back. Stephen McAleer and company, uh, they come home in second, but win in silver. First time all season that Matt Travis and Jason Hart won't taste the victory of champagne, but still third overall, second in class, and they had to come from a long way back. They did. It was a brilliant recovery drive, and I think everyone got caught out with that qualifying session being red flag yesterday and uh, didn't quite get their times in, but they just stayed patient, poised, and uh, showed their calmness there in terms of getting back to the big points once again. At the bottom of this list, a few that were less fortunate. You feel for Auto Technic, Tom Capizzi, John Capestro Dubetz had a good run going. Similar for the Marco Polo Motorsports team, that KTM Crossbow. Stephen Cameron racing, certainly in the mix with Sean Quinlan and Greg Leofouge before it went wrong. Uh, and definitely the Marilla racing car, too. Winners overall yesterday, problems very early in this one. They do not finish, they will not score points. Yeah, to see that list of retirements and cars at the bottom of the heap there, they were all potential winners in their classes. So uh, there'll be some disappointed teams here tonight. They just got to dust themselves off. Big break before we see action again at Road America in August. That's right. So a bit of a layoff for Pirelli GT4 America, but talk about going from strength to strength as far as the calendar goes. From a, a high commitment, high speed road course here at VIR to America's National Park of Speed in Elkhart Lake. A similar track in a lot of respects in terms of high commitment, high reward, also high risk. Uh, but one of the more revered circuits in North America, really on the same level as a place like this. Uh, two classics, and um, with all respect to Kerrigan Smith and the staff here, they do have better Bratwurst up there. So. <laughs> Well, they have Johnsonville right down the road, so that has something to do with it. Let's take a look at the highlights, and there are going to be plenty of them. This was the initial start. John Capestro Dubetz inherited the lead after or the pole, rather, after a crash for the original pole sitting car yesterday. Eliminated that from the fray. They go side by side here, and JCD takes the lead, but keep an eye on Kenton Cook and that B Sport Racing Aston Martin. Yeah, makes the rim shot around turn three there and thinks about taking the lead as well at this early stage. Did take the lead at one point, but JCD came back. This is a power move down the back straightaway. Cleared him well before the braking zone, and it was Auto Technic that led into the pit stop window. This was an interesting moment. Greg Leofouge, Sean Quinlan, that car into the back of the TRG car, shared by Derek DeBoer and Spencer Pompelli. A near disaster there for a couple of cars. Ultimately, it was disaster, though, though, for Stephen Cameron Racing. Something went wrong for this BMW. Yeah, Quinlan had to pull it off. Then a big slide there, but Alganian just gets wide. Gets away with this one. Wouldn't see the checkered flag here today, however. Big restart here, and Matt Travis trying to get back up to keep the win streak going. Making his way to the outside there. Stephen McAleer forcing his way through as well. Ultimately, up into second overall, and that was the end result of the final crash that ultimately led to this race ending under yellow, but that does not diminish the thrill for B Sport Racing, Kenton Cook and Brian Putt, their first chance to taste victory in Pirelli GT4 America. A lot of emotion there as those two greet each other in victory lane. Can't wait to hear what they have to say. Beautiful looking car, love what they do to the roof of that. A combination Union Jack and uh, Stars and Stripes representing, of course, the heritage of Aston Martin as well as the heritage of this team. Why don't we go down to Amanda? She will be chatting with our winners shortly. Oh, and you should see the elation here with Brian Putt and Kenton Cook. <laughs> well, Brian, you see the checkered flag for the first time in the GT4 class. Describe that experience. Um, honestly, I'm overwhelmed. It's uh, I had tears out there. This is This is more than I really ever hoped for, and my team is phenomenal. Kenton is a coach and a co-driver. Eric is my engineer. The whole gang, man. I'm I'm sitting here because of this bunch. So 
I couldn't be happier. I'm thrilled. Well, I saw your fist pump as you yeah. came around there. You were right by the guard, yeah. guardwell to cheer him on. How proud are you of Oh, Brian? man, I've, I've known this guy, working with him for five years now. It's it's great to have this kind of rewarding result for our, for our new team of the last two, couple years. So yeah, it's, it's good stuff. It's good, it's good. It's, all these guys are great. Eric, Dan, Kevin, Dan. <laughs> Danny, Danny. <laughs> all yeah, every, Bob, Bob everyone. Everybody. Oh yeah, man, we, so we've got some everyone. good people here. Congratulations, guys! Thank you very much. It always felt like it was probably just a matter of time that they would break through, but you know you can never count on anything like that happening. And what a relief that must be. Guess where they, when they say Dan, you're the man. Everyone turns around on that team. <laughs> yeah, name tag. You're going to need to put last <laughs> initials on that team to know who you're talking it's about. It's easier for the team shirts, right? Well, that's true. Yeah. I hope one size fits all. <laughs> oh, great stuff for B Sport Racing. Big win for Aston Martin as well. Their presence on this grid has just exploded in the last year and a half. Cy Jerry and his wife Susan, they've uh, taken over the distributorship for Aston Martin here in North America and done a tremendous job of it. Let's hear from more happy winners down in Victory Lane. Currently standing by with the silver winners and Toby, it seems like you guys have just been knocking on the success. What led to it here today? Uh, great team behind us, Classic BMW does an awesome job. I mean, all my guys are awesome. Alex and Ephraim and Robert and Matt and the, Justin, whole crew does an awesome job. Kirk makes awesome meals for us. It's the team, and Stephen drove awesome today. So, Stephen, the full course yellow came out. What was your reaction when you heard it? You know, to be honest, I wasn't too disappointed because the first caution that came out let us close the gap to the first three. So, you know, I could be mad and said I needed another lap there. But, you know, I'm super happy we get the win in class. You know, Toby did a great job. I want to say thanks to Eric and uh, John for letting me drive with uh, with Toby this weekend. And, you know, we've second weekend in a row where we would have been the most amount of points coming out of the weekend. So... Maybe we'll show up at another race and try again. Congratulations. Thanks. Making a strong case for it, that's for sure. We talked about it earlier in the weekend. When they showed up at Coda, we thought it was a one-off, but did incredibly well, as you would expect, two drivers of their caliber. And that's rolled right on here into VIR. And you know, Toby's the boss man. I think he's got to be enjoying this ride, too. Yeah, and I think Eric Mass is uh, very impressed at Classic BMW as well. He was over the moon with uh, Stephen's first lap yesterday and the run that they had, the performance they had. Didn't get the result with the uh, technical issue, but nonetheless, strong, strong races from that group. Dramatic finish in the AM Class 2. Let's hear about it with Amanda. Well, John, you guys started from the second to last row today. What led you to stay committed to this race? Well, I just, uh, I just knew I needed to keep up and keep us in position and uh, not fall too far behind, you know, keep it tight and uh, let Will, while Willie finished the job for me. I saw your excitement when uh, at the end of the race in the in the pit lane, so congratulations. Oh, yeah. And Chris, Thanks, Amanda. Appreciate it. when you think of the last part of this race here in VIR, what was key to victory? Uh, Capstone Motorsports, University of Alabama, roll tide, baby. Any other words for Cal? For Cal, um, maybe we'll have to go out on the golf course and see who's <laughs> old there. <laughs> Congratulations. That's easier for him to break his age, though. I'll leave that right there. <laughs> no, I mean, it's great of him to give the credit to the team, and it is a great team, brand-new team as well. But that move he made on John Jesbray, that, that was the difference, and that was experience, too. He's really good. He is. I hate to tell him that, but he's really good. <laughs> well, he's proven that, it seems like, year after year. I think Big Al might be smiling on the side of that car. Why not? Well, once again, here are the point standings leaving this weekend. Still a massive lead in Pro-Am for Hart and Travis. Well, Brian Putt, Kevin Cook, they elevate themselves from the pack just a little bit. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a healthy lead, right? It's good. How could they be beat? We've said that before. <laughs> and there's a long season still. Uh, eight more rounds of this championship still to fight out for, and a lot can happen in that time. And I wonder what might have been for Leah Fuji and Quinlan. They were in line for another good result today. Ultimately had to retire that car and some ways down the order. It might be a fight for second at this point, but we'll, we shall see. Still a long way to go. Well, up next, this series heads to Road America. We look forward to talking to you from there. So long from VIR.